Kanojo Okarishimasu might be the most immersive manga anime experience to release in recent memory. The series really makes you feel like you're truly in a toxic relationship. Not only do the two main characters have a horribly distorted and toxic relationship themselves, everyone who, against their better judgment, is still reading this pile of shit gets to roleplay their own toxic relationship with mangaka Reiji Miyajima, where no matter how much we rationally know we should stop reading Kanokari, we keep reading because occasionally he dangles a semi-decent chapter in front of us, and sometimes the chapters are so hilariously bad they horseshoe effect back into being good. For the life of me, I cannot think of another anime manga series that has become as widely ridiculed and memed as Kanojo Okadeshimasu or Rent a Girlfriend. After racking my brain, I still can't come up with a good comparison for the amalgamation of morbid curiosity, disdain, and chronic disappointment that characterizes the Kanokari readership. As much as I'm loath to admit it, I used to be a Kanokari defender, more on that later. But it's gotten to the point where I genuinely cannot fathom someone defending this series on the merits. I don't even read the manga anymore, I just skim through the pages when the updates hit manga decks, raise my eyebrows at whatever down bad tomfoolery made it into the annals of the weekly Kanokari update before heading off to reddit to see the neckbeards fume about it. What was once a reasonably entertaining yet heartily cringe inducing romantic comedy has devolved into an abject parody of itself, its author reduced to a state of mental decay that could only be fathomed by a team of seasoned psychiatrists. I desperately wish that this entire manga is just an elaborate troll by Reiji, and has actually been a piece of satire this whole time. Despite the fact that everyone universally agrees Kanokari is trash, people still eat this shit up. Just look at the number of people on reddit who still continue to hate read this clown fiesta every week. If there's one thing I can compliment Miyajima Reiji on, it's his work ethic. This absolute train wreck of a manga has birthed over 240 chapters two seasons of a television anime, and a live action adaptation. For context, Nisekoi, which was once the poster child of the excessively drawn out, uninspired harem genre, only made it to 229 chapters. But how exactly did Kanokari end up in this state? For those of you who only watched the anime or had the good sense to drop the manga before experiencing your brain cells engaging in apoptosis in real time, here's a brief summary of the major events in the Kanokari timeline. This obviously contains spoilers, but honestly I can't imagine anyone being too distraught over rent-a-girlfriend spoilers. Also this might not be entirely accurate because I really cannot be bothered to closely reread the manga for this video. So I remember at some point in season 1 in the anime, it gets established that Chizuru's goal is to become a famous actress. You find out that this is because her grandmother was once a TV and movie star. And even though Chizuru's grandmother didn't want her to follow through the same path, her grandfather encouraged and pushed her to pursue her goal of acting. Eventually you discover that Chizuru's grandfather tragically died in a car accident when Chizuru was still in high school. So basically, Chizuru uses the simp bucks that Kasuya pays her for rentals to fund her acting classes and whatnot. However, despite some initial success, Chizuru continues to fail her auditions for bigger TV and movie roles. At some point, Kazuya gets it into his head that if no one's going to accept his oh-so-beautiful and beloved Chizuru for an acting role, he'll just make his own movie to star her in. So one night, he shows up to Chizuru's apartment and tells her that he's going to fund, produce, direct, and write a short film for the express purpose of featuring Chizuru. Considering Kazuya's primary character trait as being completely unnoteworthy and talentless, this seems like a bit of a stretch. To make a long story short, somehow Kazuya does manage to scrounge up the money and the writing chops and the videography skills to make this independent film a reality. Oh yeah, at some point some other cute girl, whose name I've honestly completely forgotten, gets introduced as another neighbor of Kazuya and Chizuru, who basically only shows up whenever Reiji needs a convenient plot device to move the story somewhere. In order to film the last scene of the movie, Kazuya ends up bringing Chizuru on a romantic date to on a hot spring getaway, where it does eventually look like they're making some progress in their relationship. Chizuru tells Kazuya about her grandfather's passing and why acting is important to her. However, the big event to this arc is that just as the movie is finished, Chizuru's grandmother has a health crisis and is about to die. Kazuya then randomly procures a screen projector in the hospital so Chizuru can show her grandmother the movie in her final moments. 
At the time, quite naively in retrospect, I assumed that this was going to be a major turning point in Kazuya and Chizuru's relationship that would drive the story forward. Because after all, the death of Chizuru's last remaining relative seems like it would be a major inciting incident to force her to confront her feelings and bring Kazuya and Chizuru closer together. But surprise surprise, absolutely no progress is made here and the status quo returns. And this is basically the recurring theme of the entirety of Kanokari. Whenever it seems like something is going to happen, Reiji manages to backtrack any semblance of progress. After this, basically nothing of note happens, and the story continues as if these major revelations just didn't occur. At some point, Mami makes her triumphant return after a hundred or so chapters of irrelevance as a social media consultant for Kazuya's grandmother or something. And after many more chapters of bumbling around, the next major arc, if you can call it that, involves Kazuya's family bringing him Chizuru, Mami, Ruka, and his two random guy friends on this resort vacation. The entire time, it's teased that there's going to be a dramatic climax where he finally gets a resolution on Kazuya and Chizuru's relationship. At some point, Kazuya actually has a fairly emotional conversation with his grandmother that gives him the resolve to finally confess how he feels to Chizuru. This conversation is, by the way, immediately followed by a close-up of Ruka's ass. Kazuya runs to find Chizuru, and just as you think this might be the turning point the series has been building to for over 200 chapters, Chizuru literally cuts him off and runs away. This, somewhat understandably, leaves Kazuya distraught, thinking he's been rejected. Rejected after he literally funded, wrote, directed, and produced an entire goddamn feature-length film for this girl. And this leads us right into the now infamous chapter 218. What could have been a serious look into Kazuya's mental anguish as he confronts the reality that the girl he's dedicated so much time, effort, and emotional baggage towards doesn't actually like him is immediately undercut by the fact that the entire chapter becomes this bizarre NTR fantasy that looks like it got lost on its way to Enhen. The entire chapter is essentially just softcore pornography depicting Kazuya fantasizing about Chizuru having sexual relations with another character culminating in perhaps the most pathetic panel I've ever seen in any manga, where you can see Kazuya aggressively sobbing at the bottom of a pool while being depicted with a visible erection. After the experience of this chapter 218, there's another 15 chapters of basically nothing happening before we get the next major climax, where Mami finally confronts Kazuya and Shizuru, revealing to everyone, including Kazuya's grandmother and family, that Shizuru is in fact just a rental girlfriend and not Kazuya's real romantic partner. Just as it seems like everything is about to go up in flames, while Kazuya stands speechless and crying like a little bitch, Shizuru intervenes and proclaims that she and Kazuya are, in fact, dating, and kisses him for good measure. Reiji, of course, makes sure to depict Kazuya getting an erection from this. But once again, right when you think progress is going to be made after 230 excruciating chapters, Reiji manages to backtrack everything again. Once they return from the vacation, Chizuru literally completely ghosts Kazuya for three months, and they only see each other again after Kazuya rents her, resetting their relationship back to square one. After their date, Chizuru suggests that she can't accept Kazuya's feelings, and turns him down, only to then dangle the possibility of them truly being together, condemning Kazuya to a Sisyphusian hellscape where he's cursed to constantly futilely pursue Chizuru with a dream of dating her for real, and just when it seems like he might finally push the boulder up the hill, the whole endeavor comes crashing back down to square one. On the surface, Kanokari seems like it should be extremely forgettable. After all, there is no shortage of development light romantic comedy harem series that get churned out every year. Yet people continue to read Kanokari each week despite the fact that everyone knows that the odds of an actually decent chapter coming out are so astronomically low that the average reader of this clown show of a manga could probably get a girlfriend before Kazuya and Chizuru get together. I think the things that make Kanokari so infuriating to read at times are also directly related to the few redeeming factors the series has, and is probably why I defended it longer than I probably should have. What stands out the most about Kanokari is obviously the art. While most other series in Kanokari's general ballpark didn't have these very uninspired character designs, it's clear that five years of cranking out weekly chapters have made Reiji and his team quite adept at producing high quality art. 
as radio so often likes to remind readers through the incessant chirping of background characters, most of the female characters at Kanokari are well designed and well drawn. I wouldn't be surprised if more effort each week goes into planning Chizudo's outfit than actually goes into planning the plot and the dialogue. The problem here is that the relatively high quality art has to be juxtaposed against how ridiculous and cringeworthy the panels they're illustrating are. The prime example of this is in a recent chapter where Kazuya goes to the laundromat and finds Chizudo heading out after washing her clothes. Kazuya looks into one of the washing machines and finds one of Chizudo's bras sitting inside. The entire premise of this chapter becomes just Kazuya spurging out or the fact that he's borne witness to one of Chizuru's undergarments and there's an entire page of this chapter just dedicated to a highly detailed drawing of Chizuru's bra. Could you imagine being the assistant whose job it was to painstakingly touch up and detail Chizuru's bra in order to just justify Kazuya's perversion? Artwork aside, the primary cast of Kazuya and Chizuru, and to a lesser extent of Ruka and Mami, are actually sometimes reasonably interesting and compelling characters, especially in comparison to what you usually get in this genre. On the surface, Kazuya seems to be an average harem main character, someone who is painfully mediocre and without many meaningful personality traits of an attractive woman, but nonetheless is the undying love of an entire cohort of impossibly beautiful girls. But despite how insanely cringy much of his dialogue and actions frequently are, Kazuya definitely tries to be a good person. One could theoretically imagine a woman being attracted to him without having to entirely suspend their disbelief. As much as I memed the entire movie saga, you have to give Kazuya some credit. He clearly genuinely cares for Chizuru and takes proactive steps to do things for her, often a great person of sacrifice, even though she just treats him like a human ATM. Unless there's some kind of massive gigachad, and let's face it, that doesn't apply to anyone reading Kanokari, we all have related to or felt like Kazuya at some point in our lives. Someone who feels deeply average and mediocre, but has feelings for someone who we perceive to be impossibly out of our league. Which is why deep down, many of us want Kazuya to finally succeed if Chizuru, even though he definitely doesn't deserve it. When you look at some of Kazuya's interactions with his family, namely how his grandmother basically constantly treats him like an invalid who can't do anything right, Kazuya actually becomes a somewhat sympathetic character. But what's extremely frustrating is that whenever it seems like Kazuya is about to become a more mature person with a more nuanced understanding of his relationship with Chizuru, his thought process is almost immediately backtracked to just, oh wow, Chizuru is so hot, let me spurg out now. Chizuru is an interesting case because I remember when season 1 of the anime aired, most of the focus was on Kazuya and how people found him to be probably the most pathetic anime main character in the modern anime canon. Don't get me wrong, he is, but in order to drag out the plot of Kanokari as much as possible, Reiji has effectively written Chizuru as this extremely unlikable, almost borderline sociopathic way where it has been established for over 200 chapters that Chizuru is well aware of Kazuya's feelings towards her. But milking readers demands that Chizuru refuses to ever confront her feelings or ever give Kazuya the light of day. The central conflict for basically the last 200 chapters has been Chizuru constantly waffling about whether to accept Kazuya's feelings or not. You're sort of meant to sympathize with Chizuru because her entire family is now dead and she doesn't want to show vulnerability because she's always had to be self-sufficient, but in effect she just comes off as incredibly manipulative and unlikable after 200 chapters of this routine. Take the whole rental girlfriend situation. The entire premise for why Kazu and Chizuru have to keep up the boyfriend-girlfriend charade is for their families. Chizuru at any point could have just been like, hey, this is an unfortunate situation. You don't have to rent me to see your parents as long as the agency doesn't find out. But Chizuru just constantly milks Kazuya's wallet dry to the point where he still has to rent her after they nominally get together at the end of the Hot Springs Resort arc. In essence, reading Kanokari is a lot like the relationship between its two main characters that is highly toxic. Kazuya and Chizuru are both clearly too emotionally stunted and immature to actually ever be in a functioning relationship together. Kazuya's thoughts have barely advanced past, wow, Chizuru is so sexy, and Chizuru continues to nonsensically string him along so Reiji can keep up his serialization in Shonen Jump. But every once in a while, there are chapters of actual emotional payoff containing dialogue that seems like it could plausibly come out of the mouths of real people. Around the end of the movie-making arc, there actually seemed to be some hope that the story might go somewhere. 
Kazuyo got some real development, where he proactively tries to do something for Chuzuru rather than just spurging out about how good her hair smells. And the entire exercise ends with a relatively decent chapter where Kazuya is able to vocalize how he feels and why he's attracted to Chizuru, and Chizuru is finally able to break the rental girlfriend facade and show some vulnerability around Kazuya, bringing out an emotional payoff that actually maybe might have justified the previous 140 chapters. Recently, in chapter 244, Reiji showed that he is capable of writing normal conversations between his characters. Even in the case of the dreaded chapter 218, the idea wasn't the worst. The idea of having Kazuya finally come to terms with the fact that the girl he has idolized and yearned for might not actually like him by having him imagine Chizuru banging the beret guy has some merit. It's just that when said fantasy now consumes more than half the length of the chapter, you have to stop the one wonder what is going on in the mangaka's head. What makes Kanokari so frustrating, and indeed probably why so many people still read new chapters knowing that nothing is going to happen, is that every once in a while there is a decent, dare I say actually good chapter with emotional payoff. Reiji has demonstrated an ability to write a passable, maybe even actively good romance manga, but instead chooses to write the most hilariously down bad, cringeworthy, or otherwise completely forgettable dialogue and character interactions possible. I'd really like to believe that this is just a case of Reiji milking readers for a paycheck. After all, I'd like to think that a man who's married with children would have a better grasp on human relationships than whatever monstrosity he reflects in Kanokari. Maybe Reiji is actually a genius who deliberately writes most chapters to be as shitty as possible, so on the rare occasion he writes a chapter that would otherwise be completely average in a decent romance manga, it seems like a stroke of literary genius by comparison. But when you read this guy's Twitter, it really does seem like he's inserting into Kazuya and living out some bizarre fantasy with Chizuru. He recently started putting out these illustrations of Chizuru superimposed onto photographs of real life locations including one of her getting out of the shower of a captain stating, quote, This girl is my beautiful girlfriend and her name is Chizuru Mizuhara, end quote. In another tweet, he comments about how he wishes he could be able to take off the clothes of a one-to-one -one scale figurine of Chizuru. Like, look, I get that these tweets get a lot of engagement and maybe it's just an elaborate troll, but it increasingly seems like Reiji is losing his grasp on reality and Kanokari is his outlet for coping with his failing marriage. Who knows, maybe the entire story of Kanokari is meant to be an elaborate social commentary that's going to end of a curveball where the author reveals this entire story was actually an exercise in demonstrating a toxic and dysfunctional relationship and that none of the characters deserve to have each other or to be in fulfilling intimate relationships because of their crippling unresolved personality flaws. Or maybe at the end of the day, we the readers are the ones who need mental help because we're still reading this after over 240 chapters.